Good afternoon. It's good to have all of you here today. Welcome to the Institute for Faith in the Public Square's Conference on Baptist Voices on Religious Liberty, Left, Right, and Center. As you've been noticing in the news lately, issues regarding religious liberty are quite a bit uh, in the news. And Baptists have been standing for religious liberty ever since Thomas Helwes penned the first plea for religious liberty in the English language, The Mystery of Iniquity. Uh, two weeks after getting a copy to King James, he was imprisoned as a result of it, and he died in prison. So religious liberty is an issue with which, or for which Baptists have long had a part, and something with which is, which is dear to our hearts because of the importance of it. And that's what we wanted to speak today is to have Baptists from different countries, different regions, different backgrounds, to come and share their perspectives on the value of religious liberty, the state of religious liberty where they are, their region, and the status of religious liberty globally. And so I will get out of the way and uh, let the speakers come up. Our first speaker is Dr. Russell Moore. He's president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, a position he has held since 2013. Uh, before that, he was provost at Southern Seminary. Now, I have to get my dig in here, because they always like to say they're the Southern Baptist Seminary, but we all know that they don't believe this because it's not in their URL. It's not tsbts.edu, just sbts, and we know that all things online are true. And so, uh, Dr. Moore is uh, married to Maria, and he's the father of five boys. So, Dr. Moore, it's a pleasure to have you. Well, good afternoon. I'd like to uh, begin by reading a very familiar pastor scripture in Acts 16. Acts 16, beginning with verse 25, in which Luke tells us this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and they departed. I am a longtime fan of the artist Johnny Cash, late uh, country musician. And one of the things that Johnny Cash used to always uh, remark about was whenever he would finish at a concert, people would come up and shake hands with him. And often, there would be someone who would come up and say, my father was in prison with you. And of course, uh, Johnny Cash knew he never was in prison. Uh, and he didn't really want to correct this person. He would just say, well, how's your daddy doing? And, uh, and move on. But he had sung songs and had written songs about life in, in prison, Folsom Prison Blues, about listening to the sound of trains going by from a, from a jail cell. He'd written about the visceral sense of, of guilt and culpability of shooting a man in Reno just to watch him die, that it seemed to these people entirely credible that he had been a prisoner, that he had been in jail 
and that now this sort of gravity that he had came from the jailhouse. I mean, that, that sort of reality transcends genres. I mean, every once in a while, we'll hear of a hip-hop artist who has uh, talked about a very rough uh, background of being in a gang and being in prison and, uh, and being in, in rough situations. And then it's discovered that this artist actually grew up in Malibu or, or somewhere in some uh, really privileged sort of suburban place. And the, the jailhouse mystique was just part of the shtick. It was a, a, a way of adding gravity to a life. Now, for those of us who are Baptists, we are people who come out of a jailhouse religion. And it is very difficult sometimes to connect the reality of our forebears in prisons in England and in Virginia and in Massachusetts with the reality that we see around us today, where so often Baptists are, are living peaceably and in many parts of the country are even uh, the majority uh, in those places. But in order for us to be the people who maintain a witness to religious liberty, we have to remember what it means to be people of the jailhouse. And that's not only true in terms of our Baptist history, but our larger history within the body of Christ that we see here in the book of Acts in which so often we have the people of God who are coming up against the political authorities and the economic authorities and finding themselves on the wrong side. That's what's happened here. Apostle Paul is in Ephesus. There's a, a slave girl who has been uh, possessed with a, a demon, and the Apostle Paul heals her, but his healing of her through the power of Jesus becomes a problem in the public square because she has an economic benefit to the people who are using her for her, her gifts and her, and her powers. So now Apostle Paul and Silas find themselves in prison, and as they are in prison, a couple of things happen that I think are completely relevant to what it means for us to contend for religious liberty in the years to come. Especially when, as American culture secularizes, we are going to more and more be called upon to articulate things that we previously could assume. And here are a couple of things that I think we need to keep in mind. The first is this. We notice in this text that the gospel propels us to give up our rights. Notice what's happening here. Apostle Paul and Silas are in prison. Scripture says that they're singing hymns. And it says that suddenly an earthquake comes and the walls of the prison come down. This is deliverance. We've, we've seen this happen before, even in the book of Acts to the apostle Peter. God delivers him from prison and he leaves and he goes on about his mission. But that's not what happens here. Paul and Silas stay. And why do they stay? They stay because of the gospel and the advance of the mission. The jailer is crying out, is about to commit suicide because he is fearful of the sort of accountability that he's going to have for losing his prisoners. And Paul and Silas have compassion, and they have compassion for an agent of imperial Rome. They have compassion for someone who should have been their enemy, and they have the sort of compassion that engages this person with the gospel. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be delivered? How can I get out of this uh, situation that I am in? And Paul and Silas speak those very famous words to anyone who's been in a church for very long. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. In this, you see Paul and Silas who care less about their own personal safety they care less about their own personal rights than they do about the advance of the gospel and about this jailer who could have easily just been a footnote in their stories. 
the guy that they passed on the way out of the jail. Now, there are a couple reasons why this is important. One of them is because we see in this the personal nature of the gospel. This is someone who is a bit player in the story of the Roman Empire, and yet he has a mention here in the book of Acts because the gospel addresses him personally. This is why Baptists fundamentally have been committed to religious liberty. It is not because of some political philosophy that we have. It is because of how we believe the gospel works. The gospel works by an addressing of the conscience of person by person by person where individual people are made right with God and then brought into the community and into the people of God. And so one cannot somehow coerce people into believing. One certainly cannot use the power of the state in order to turn people into Christians because state power or economic power or community pressure can never make people Christians. It can only make people pretend Christians. The gospel works with the spirit convicting the heart and the heart crying out for deliverance and crying out for mercy. This isn't happening before, as this jailer is hearing the hymns and he's perhaps hearing the teaching, maybe even hearing the Apostle Paul dictating the letters. But when the convicting power of the Holy Spirit comes upon him at this moment of crisis in his life, he personally cries out for deliverance and he is hurt. Apostle Paul and Silas consider that to be of such fundamental importance in terms of their mission that this man's reconciliation to God is of such importance that they are willing to stay in the prison where they probably had been praying to be released in order to see to it that he would be reconciled to God. We give up our rights for the sake of the gospel. Now, let me tell you why that's significant and important in terms of religious liberty. Significant and important because everything that offends us is not persecution. We have not been promised a life without offense. And often what, it, what we can easily do as Christians is to turn into an interest group that simply lashes out at anyone who offends us or who disagrees with us. I was uh, several years ago on a plane and I picked up the uh, magazine that the airline has in the back of the seat pocket in front of me and I was flipping through it and there were a couple of, uh, there were a couple of ads, it was around Christmas time, there were a couple of ads. Uh, one of the ads is advertising some product and it says, who says it's better to give than to receive? And my response was, Jesus, you know. And then I, I kept flipping a, a few pages over and there was another ad that said, silent nights are overrated. And I, I was just offended and I thought, you know, what, why, why would you in the pages of this magazine ridicule the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. And why would you ridicule the words that Jesus has spoken? And then, you know how you do. I started getting into this. Well, would they do that with any other religious group? No, they wouldn't. This is just, a, you know, what I was doing there had nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I was doing there was protecting myself. And I was offended not for the sake of Jesus. Jesus can handle beer companies and grill companies uh, using his words for advertising. I was offended because they were making fun of me as a Christian. That's not a gospel response. 
There are going to be many things that are going to happen in the culture around us where we may be offended and we may be spoken against that are not going to be violations of our religious liberty or of our religious freedom. We must be willing to be offended. We must be willing often to be marginalized for the sake of the gospel. Because we understand and know that the gospel has to go forward, and often that is going to mean giving up our rights in many circumstances. But notice also, though, what's happening here is in this text, the gospel propels us at the same time to stand up for our rights. Paul and Silas, willing to stay, not going to leave, giving up their freedom to leave. They should never have been arrested. They should never have been in jail. They had every legal right to leave. And not only that, they had the providence of God enabling them to leave. But they stayed for the sake of the gospel. And yet, when the magistrates sent word by the police saying, you can go on your way, Paul's reaction is, I'm not going on my, on my way. Are you kidding me? He says, you arrest people who are Roman citizens and you violate the law by beating us uncondemned without trial and throw us into jail. And now you come and tell us, just go on your way and leave? No. He says, if you want us to leave, you come and tell us. And so the magistrates come and apologize. Now, why is that the case? It is not because Paul is offended. It is for the exact same reason that Paul gave up his rights before, for the sake of the advance of the gospel. Paul is leaving behind a community of people that he does not want to be imperiled in Philippi for their beliefs, for the fact that they are practicing their lives as Christians. So he appeals here to his Roman citizenship in the same way that he does elsewhere in the book of Acts. That is not because Paul is trying to make sure that he clings to everything that is due to him. Paul is clinging to his rights for the sake of others, for the sake of the community. That is crucially imperative for us to know. And here's why. There are some Christians who want to organize simply as an interest group. And sometimes these Christians, as they organize as an interest group, act as though Christians have rights because we are a majority, whether that majority is real or imagined. That is not a gospel witness to religious liberty. But there are other Christians who, having seen that, can adopt a sort of mentality that seems really spiritual, that says when we're thinking about these issues of religious liberty, let's simply give up our rights. As I heard uh, one uh, church planter put it at an event uh, that, that I was at talking about issues of religious liberty, he says, rather than fighting for our place at the table, let's just give up the table. Now that sounds really spiritual and it sounds really commendable until you realize what it is that one is actually saying. We are not in the context of a democratic republic standing simply where Jesus was standing before Pilate. We are also standing where Pilate was standing because the final accountability in our system of government rests with the people. And so the decisions that we are making as citizens about soul freedom and religious liberty, these things don't simply have to do with us. They have to do with future generations of the church and they have to do with our mission field. And so when we simply say, I'm not willing to stand up 
for religious liberty, we are actually acting in ways that are profoundly selfish and profoundly anti-gospel. But what that means is that if we are going to be the people who like the Apostle Paul and like Silas here are contending for uh, every legal protection that we can for those areas that the government ought not to have uh, supervisory oversight over, that means that we have to be just as zealous for the freedom rights of people who are not yet Christians as we do for people who are Christians, and in many cases, even more so. So, for instance, in a community, when the city council wants to zone a mosque out of existence, often there will be people who are Christians who will come to the city council and petition the, the council to zone the mosque out of existence or to zone the Muslim cemetery out of existence. The Christians who do that are Christians who have lost confidence in the gospel because these Christians are assuming that somehow the city council has the power to regenerate the Muslims in their community. That's not what happens. What happens is when the power of the sword is used to shut down the house of worship for our Muslim neighbors, all that has happened is that our mission field goes underground and they recognize the people who are Christians around me hate me and want to see me invisible. An evangelistic church is not doing that to its mission field. And they also recognize that this group of Christians has handed a sword to Caesar that does not belong to Caesar. Caesar is not given responsibility to separate the sheep from the goats or the wheat from the tares. Caesar has been given a responsibility to maintain public order and the advance of the gospel goes forward through the power of the spirit, not through the power of the sword. When we stand up for those who are not part of our community, and we are petitioning for their freedoms, we are not arguing that all religious truth claims are equal. Far be it from that. We are instead arguing to the government, we are going to have this conversation about ultimate things, and we are going to seek to persuade one another about ultimate things and we have with us the gospel and the power of the Spirit, we do not need government bureaucrats in order to be involved in that. And it also means that we are guarding consciences that may often differ from our own, even within the body of Christ. One of the, I, I believe, unique challenges that we have to religious liberty in the world around us right now is that many of the people who are seeking to restrict religious liberty are not evil people who are plotting in a lair to destroy uh, religion. Most of them simply don't understand religious motivations. They don't understand what it means for someone to believe that he or she will stand before the judgment seat of Christ or the equivalent in some other religion. So they assume there must be something else really at work here. These people must really be motivated uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of power or in terms of money, and they don't understand it. So when I was having a conversation with someone in the military one time about uh, the rights of chaplains, uh, evangelical chaplains to pray in Jesus' name, the, uh, this military person said, well, we've got an easy way to fix this. Just when they're praying, pray in your name. And then that way you say in your name 
The chaplain will know who he's talking about, but it's not going to be offensive to anyone else. Or just don't say that part at all, because what difference does it make? I mean, it's, it's three words uh, in a prayer. Well, that is equivalent to saying, come on, Cap uh, Catholic chaplain, why don't you serve the Eucharist to everybody because it's just bread and wine? Well, it's not just bread and wine if you're a Catholic chaplain. And I tried to explain to him, for a conservative evangelical chaplain, one does not pray unless one is praying through the mediatorial office of Jesus Christ. When we are dealing often with people who don't understand what religious motivations are, we also have to be the people who are paying attention to consciences that differ from ours so that they are not having violence done to them either. Apostle Paul talks about this in the context of the church in which he says you have differing levels of conscience and he says don't bind one another with your consciences because what is not ever uh, what is not uh, from faith is sin when we advocate for the little sisters of the poor about uh, the mandate to purchase contraceptive drugs and devices we do not have to agree with the little sisters of the poor on uh, contraception broadly defined in order to understand that for them purchasing these drugs or devices will do violence to their consciences. When we advocate for that Muslim student to wear the head covering uh, in a school or in a place, we do not have to agree that that is an important thing in order to say the conscience of this person is going to have violence done to her if she does not wear this. We are pleading and advocating for freedom and for conscience for all people precisely in order to set the sorts of precedents into place that are going to allow the gospel to flourish the only way the gospel can flourish, which is conscience to conscience among free and uncoerced people. Which means that we need to be the sort of people who are not only speaking about religious liberty in the public square, although that's critically important. More important than that, though, for the future of religious liberty is what goes on in churches and in Sunday schools and in vacation Bible school. If people recognize and know what salvation is, that salvation comes through the person in an encounter with the crucified and resurrected Christ. And if a child is taught that the church is an embassy of the coming kingdom of God and is therefore not under the spiritual direction of the state, and if the child is, thought, is taught to give honor to all of those who are in places of civic authority and to give obedience in every legitimate area to those who are in civic authority, but to recognize and know that they are not Americans first, they are not citizens first, they are first part of the global body of Christ that will be around after the Washington Monument is gone. Then you have the beginnings of an understanding of religious liberty, an understanding of the freedom of the church in a free state that is going to be able to be perpetuated over and against generations. And you'll be able then to cultivate people who are willing to be offended, people who are willing to be marginalized, and who are willing to rejoice in that because they know that a disciple is not above his teacher. And people who are willing to stand up to Caesar and to say, you will not encroach upon the power of the conscience. You will not encroach upon the embassy of the kingdom in the local church. And it could be 
that who knows, we end up in a situation where in the years to come, many of our children may find themselves in difficult situations around the world, as many of our brothers and sisters are right now. Who knows, maybe even here in the United States of America. But as I often say to our folks, I feel like I have two callings. One is to keep us out of jail, and the other is to make sure that we're willing to go to jail. Because there's one thing worse than being in jail, and that's having a faith that is too safe to jail. Remarkable things can happen in times of persecution, but it can only happen if you have a people who understand the power of the gospel, even in a jailhouse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Our next speaker uh, comes from uh, Canada, from Nova Scotia. Dr. William Br uh, uh, Brackney is a former teacher at Houghton College, Colgate-Rochester Divinity School, Eastern Baptist Seminary, and uh, was principal at McMaster Divinity School. He has since 2006 been at Acadia College, uh, where he is the Millard R. Millard R. Cherry Distinguished Professor of Christian Thought and Ethics and the Director of the Acadia Center of Baptist and Anabaptist Studies. Now, coming from Louisiana, we have a, a warm spot in our hearts for people in Acadia because it was the Acadians that came down here being shipped by the, Fr by the English at the end of the French and Indian Wars or the Seven Years' War, depending on which side on, you were on, and are now called the Cajuns. And so having that historical connection is uh, an aspect that brings him here as well. So Dr. Brackney, we welcome you and look forward to hearing what you have to say. I did neglect one other important thing. Uh, he's married to Catherine and they have two sons and a daughter. Thank you, it's good to be here. I'm an American in disguise. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., emigrated to Canada, and a lot of Canadians hear that American accent along the way. When I come to the States, I'm, I've got a Canadian accent, so running back and forth across North America has been an interesting experience in life, and uh, I've learned a lot and continue to be a, a student of both cultures. My whole orientation is one of a North American model to uh, Baptist life and uh, religious culture because I think that that line of demarcation is becoming less and less uh, important in how continentally we try to resolve problems and issues. And by the way, I do bring you greetings from the Acadians. We live in that neighborhood actually in Grand Pre, only a few kilometers from where the ships took out the Acadians and uh, took them to France or New England or to Louisiana where they learned to cook. Um, or some of them hid in the uh, trees and waited until the English needed to know how to operate the dike system. And then the Acadians were social heroes. And also greetings from Acadia University, which is named for that experience, Canada's oldest Baptist institution. My invitation is to address the issue of religious freedom in Canada, and I will stick fairly closely to my manuscript given the time. Canada's understanding of religious freedom and the nation's pathway toward religious liberty is distinct from that of the United States. Canada is arguably the leading liberal democracy in the world and it has a well-founded and articulate philosophy of religious freedom, generally referred to as religious pluralism. What makes Canada different is its political and social pilgrimage from multiple religious establishments to a fully pluralistic religious culture. And I want to walk through, as time permits, some of the narrative. We in Canada are a nation of two cultures become three cultures, the Francophones, the Anglophones, and the Aboriginal peoples. 
In every respect, the earliest Canadian foundation, Christian foundation in Canada was a comprehensive religious establishment and an effective one. In 1627, the French Crown Chartered Compagnie de saint Associés, the company of 100 associates, was to settle only Roman Catholics in the colony. It funded the cost of Roman Catholic worship and provided for three priests in each of the colony's settlements for 15 years. Protestant religious services were not tolerated and Catholics monopolized public offices and professions. Upon that foundation, various Catholic religious orders embarked upon a program of evangelization and a culturalization among the aboriginal population that produced a parish system and trading outpost network that extended from the Gaspé to the Great Lakes, Illinois country. These included the Recollect, the Jesuits, Sulpicians, Ursulines, Capuchins, and Franciscans. The result of all this effort was to create a bond between Catholic and Aboriginal that is one of the best examples of religious syncretism in the Americas. Catholic clergy were all powerful and pervasive in the everyday life of New France. They were responsible for education, social assistance, medical services, and often social life and community well-being. The church calendar set days of celebration and reflection around which civic and family life revolved. In every house, there are evidences of Catholic faith. Clergy held the prime land allotments and managed the emerging towns and cities. When Francois de Laval created the Grand Seminaire at Quebec in 1663, he instituted a communalism that reflected the early church as he understood it and set a pattern for independent North American Catholic establishment. The seminaire created a line of priests that would ensure and protect the Catholic religious vitality of New France. Cities like Quebec, trois rivieres and Montreal became the capitals of both the politics and religious character of the colony, built along the St. Lawrence and through to the Great Lakes. Over the course of the 17th and early 18th centuries, the Catholic Church in Canada, a church of mystics and martyrs, to use Robert Choquette's term, became a highly effective social and political fusion. To English and Scottish Protestants, this was the focus of an unwanted reversal in North America, mind you, of the Protestant Reformation. The Anglican narrative. Enter the dominant form of English Protestant establishment the Church of England. Beginning with the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, the Church of England made plans to become the English Christian establishment in the colonies that would become Canada, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, Lower Canada, Upper Canada. This was accomplished primarily through the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge, SPCK, and the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, the SPG. These organizations, plus the later Evangelical Church Missionary Society, would build a strong Anglican base in Canada. English establishment meant the lion's share of funding for religious purposes, the exclusive right of Anglican clergy to perform marriages, the sole right of its parishes to form corporations to hold property and political control over establishing educational institutions. There's much more to be said there. Presbyterians also played a part in that story. They exercised a political will that was focused in some key geographical areas, they feeling that they were a form of old world establishment as well. Now, what I want to focus on at this point for a few minutes is voluntarism, a Canadian piece of vocabulary, much influenced by the turn of events in the East Coast British colonies become the United States of America, the Canadians moved haltingly toward a greater sense of religious toleration and ultimately religious equality in the 19th century. Key to this evolution were Methodists, 
Presbyterians, and especially the Baptists. He was a pastor, editorialist, and educator among the Baptists of Upper Canada, Robert A. Fife, who made the most successful assault on Anglican establishment. Fife objected to any form of church-state compact to aid education, particularly the clergy reserves provisions. Between 1846 and 1850, Fife urged the adoption of a voluntarist system where public education would be the responsibility of the provincial or state government on a non-sectarian basis and denominational colleges would be supported voluntarily by the churches. Fife, a Baptist pastor and educator, thus led the struggle in Canada's leading province for religious freedom and equality. Much of his thinking was incorporated into the Great Charter of 1850. Ironically, in later development, and this is true still today, Fife's voluntary principle was reshaped to allow for public support of denominational colleges that secured university charters. This would become a test case in the evolving Canadian meaning of religious freedom. Eventually, the mainstream denominations shared in an arrangement that brought public funding to train ministers in a limited circle of Christian groups in Ontario, including Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Baptists, and Roman Catholics. All of this pushback against establishmentarianism the previous two centuries collectively became known as religious voluntarism in Canadian terminology. The His Dominion movement is another interesting Canadian vintage chapter. The 1860s <coughs> excuse me, were a time of nation building for British North America. The central provinces found common cause with the Maritimes in the far west and a dominion of Canada where the monarchy and British Parliament continued to be the loci of civil authority were born. The British North America Act of 1867 made no direct statements about religion, and the underlying assumption was that the status quo was protected. In fact, the school rights of religious minorities in the Canadas was frozen as they appeared in 1866. Christian leaders, of which Baptists were numbers, uh, from across the Protestant denomination engaged in a conscious effort from 1867 through the 1890s to make Canada an intentionally Christian nation with a Protestant character. Known as the His Dominion Movement, it focused on making Canada a fulfillment of Leonard Tilley's reading of Psalm 72.8, he shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river, which was taken to be the St. Lawrence, to the ends of the earth. The His Dominion movement found expression among both denominations and evangelical agencies. Here was a new form of Canadian quasi-establishment fostered with the best intentions from a Christian perspective. It would prevail through World War II the impact of the quiet revolution. In the social and political upheaval of the 1960s, Canada went through a stunning turn of events. In 1967, driven by Charles de Gaulle's Viva le Quebec declaration, the province of Quebec underwent the quiet revolution behind secularist leaders like Jean Lesage, René Lévesque, and Robert Bourassa, all trained in Jesuit schools. Their goal was to build a modern liberal state devoid of anything close to an establishment religion. And as a separatist movement, they also called for an independent nation of Quebec. Their disappointment in, with the Catholic Church in labor disputes and the political machinations of Catholic leaders had soured them on the official role of the church. There was little to no interest in any Protestant alternatives. 
What ensued from the decade of the 60s was a new form of establishment, that of a pluralist society that really meant the enthronement of secularism or the religion of no religion, allowing no hindrance or restriction on religion the growing religious diversity of Canada through immigration was inspired by there now being no dominant religious tradition, a legal sanction for uh, toleration built upon a philosophical foundation in religious liberty, and a clear policy enforcing strict separation of religion and the state. Religious disinterest set in. One provincial legislature who was elected in the 1990s on a platform of restoring religious foundations to public policy observed to this writer that upon assuming his work in the provincial legislature, he became immediately aware of the irrelevance of religion and religious values in making public policy. The outstanding expression of this swing toward pluralism was the Canadian Charter of Rights, 1982, the principal achievement of Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Regarding religious freedom, the Charter provides as fundamental freedoms freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication, freedom of peaceful assembly, and freedom of association. Important in the ongoing interpretation of constitutional religious freedom in Canada, resembling that in the United States, is the principle of reasonable accommodation. As litigated in provincial courts in the Supreme Court of Canada, reasonable accommodation is recognized when some religious practices can be tolerated where the greater public good is not harmed. Examples of reasonable accommodation that have been upheld are the aboriginal deer meat burning ritual in British Columbia, religious exercises in the workplace, student kirpans, ceremonial daggers worn on public school property, Sikh RCMP officers wearing turbans, work time off for the celebration of Jewish Hanka, and maintenance of Roman Catholic separate schools in Ontario, and the Hutterite communal property rights granted in Manitoba. And I might note along the way of recent interest in the rights of, the, of a religious minority is the practice by Muslim women to wear a face covering called a niqab during citizenship swearing in. That will probably go to the high courts because the Conservative Party has attempted to disallow it. The electoral mandate of a given political party in Canada may have been an important influence on the ebbing and flowing of religious vitality as seen in the Progressive Conservative Party that champions religious values in its rhetoric and the designation of a cabinet minister for religious freedom while the Liberal Party follows the trends set in the Quiet Revolution and the Charter of Rights, determining religion to be a private, individual concern. Former Liberal Party leader Michael Ignatieff, a Harvard professor actually and Canadian, led a group of scholars in the development of a completely secularist understanding of human rights. The current opposition party, the NDP, believes that encouraging religious tolerance and promoting religious freedom throughout the world is essential. And is, it is determined to fight against hate, discrimination, and intolerance. Finally, internationally, Canada is arguably a leading advocate and the theoretical base of human rights on the world stage, which includes, of course, freedom of religion. It has and does ardently support an international program of protecting religious freedom. John Peters Humphrey, the principal architect of the United Nations Charter on Human Rights and the first director of the UN Division on Human Rights, was a Canadian Christian. Study centers honoring Humphrey's work existed at major universities. Madame Justice Louise Arbour, a distinguished Canadian jurist, and Catholic Christian, 
was the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2004 to 2008. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights was established at, in uh, 2014 in Winnipeg by a Jewish ph philanthropist. It is unique in all the world. On the 19th of February, 2013, the Government of Canada officially opened its Office of Religious Freedom with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development Canada. A Canada-based ambassador and a team of officials carry out the office's mandate, which is to protect and advocate on behalf of religious minorities under threat, oppose religious hatred and intolerance, and promote Canadian values of pluralism and tolerance abroad. Canada's 300-year pilgrimage toward religious freedom is unique, and it has produced in pluralism a unique national ideology. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brackney. As we go to conclude our first section here of our speakers, uh, our next speaker is Dr. J. Brent Walker. Uh, and to show the extent of God's grace and mercy, even lawyers can be welcomed into the family of faith. We've seen that since the time of Tertullian. And uh, Dr. Walker uh, had a, has his law degree and was for 10 years a professor at Georgetown University Law Center. Since 2003, he's been an adjunct professor at the Baptist Theological Seminary at Richmond. Uh, in 1986, he left the law practice he had in Tampa or was with the law uh, firm that he was with in Tampa to go to Southern Seminary to get his theological training. Uh, he is married, his wife is Nancy, and they have two children. Uh, he has, since 1989, had an association with the Baptist Joint Committee, now it's the Baptist Joint Committee on Religious Liberty, and since 1999 has been its executive director. Uh, he is both a member of the Supreme Court Bar and an ordained minister. So, Dr. Walker, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lloyd, for that introduction. Indeed, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. At this seminar titled Baptist Voices on Religious Liberty, left, right, and center. And I've been trying to figure out where I fit in that spectrum. In Washington, D.C., um, where the Baptist Joint Committee has done its work for the past 80 years, defending and extending religious liberty, not just for Baptists, but for all of God's children and for non-believers as well. We work with a, just a whole bunch of different groups, religious groups, civil liberties groups, secular groups, uh, in uh, our work in the Congress, in the Supreme Court, in the administration, and other venues. And, and depending upon who you ask about Brent Walker, someone will say, well, he's a rock rib conservative. And you ask somebody else, and they'll say, ah, oh, he's a nice guy, but he's a dang liberal. So it depends on who you ask. If you ask me, I think I'm right smack dab in the sensible center. So we'll, we'll let you decide, okay? <laughs> I do wanna talk about religious liberty um, and ask the question, how are we doing in our fight for religious liberty at the Baptist Joint Committee and in culture generally? And when you listen to the media and the culture generally, you'll hear two narratives often. And my friend Russell Moore in his sermon at chapel this morning and remarks this afternoon has foreshadowed this idea. But there's a bunch of folks over here on this side that think Christians are being persecuted in the United States. Religious liberty is going down the tubes. We're going to hell in a handbasket as a culture. Things couldn't be worse when it comes to religious liberty. And then you have a bunch of folks over here on the other side 
that say we have too much religion in our culture, too much religion, religious talk in the public square, e e even too much religious accommodation, that, that, that religious exercise should be treated no differently than, than comparable secular pursuits, no accommodation whatsoever uh, of, of religion and religious liberty. Well, I think both of those ideas, both of those narratives are absolutely wrong-headed. We need a, a, a more focused, nuanced examination of the subject. What aspect of religious liberty are you talking about? Because depending upon what you're talking about, the answer is going to be different. And that's what I want to do here for the next few minutes. Talk about um, four constitutional principles uh, that protect our, what we all believe to be God-given religious liberty, our soul freedom. And I aim to, to look at each one of those four and, and, and comment on where I think we are and how we are, we are doing. Three First Amendment principles ensure religious liberty and require the separation of church and state. And then there's one provision over in Article 6 of the Constitution, not the Bill of Rights, but Article 6 in the Constitution proper, dealing with the relationship not between church and state, but between religion and politics. So that's where I'm going to be going for the next few minutes. Quick review of the the three First Amendment principles to start with. The first 16 words in the Bill of Rights, right smack dab up front. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The first part of that is the no, what's called the no establishment clause. What does the no establishment clause mean? Well, briefly, it means, first of all, no official religion, no national church, no state church, no theocracy, no Christian nation, legally and constitutionally, which many people believe mistakenly that we have. It also means no preferring one religion over another. Government shouldn't be in the, in, in the position of giving one religion preference or one denomination a leg up over, over others. Government should not be engaged in picking and choosing favorites when it comes to religion. It should, be, it should treat all religion the same. And thirdly, it also means for many of us, including myself and the Baptist Joint Committee, although this is not universally subscribed to, it means no advancing religion in general over irreligion, that even if the, if the government can be even-handed, and I would suggest that it probably can't, it always tends to favor the majority religion, but even if it could be even-handed in its aid of religion across the board, it would be an, an impermissible establishment of religion. So in a word, it means no helping religion from the hand of government. Free exercise clause, the last part of those 16 words, or the free exercise thereof, means no burdening or interfering with religious uh, practice almost all of the time, absent some rare compelling state interest on the part of government to protect the health, safety, welfare of society generally or third parties that might be detrimentally affected by an accommodation and that it should do so in the least restrictive means possible, narrowly tailored to uh, encroach as little as possible on the exercise of religion, even where it has a compelling interest to assert. So, in short, no hurting religion, no establishment, no helping religion, free exercise, no hurting religion. Government instead must be neutral towards religion. Uh, neither advancing it nor inhibiting it, but turning it loose, leaving it alone and allowing people of faith to exercise their religion as they see fit rather than as government might want them to. Uh, in, in the words of a great Methodist freedom fighter uh, from a generation ago that, uh, ago that I had the privilege of working with for a few years when I first went to Washington 25 years ago, Dean Kelly would say, government may and sometimes must get out of the way of religion, but it should never ever get behind and push. Get out of the way, but no pushing. Free exercise, no establishment. Um, 
So those are the first and, and, and second principle in the First Amendment. Uh, there's two clauses, but there are three principles because the third principle sort of comes out of both of those no establishment and free exercise clauses. And it's called the church autonomy doctrine church autonomy doctrine. It's not just churches that it, it's involved. All houses of worship uh, across the board um, are protected. And, and this doctrine says that, that government cannot interfere with the, 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 the internal operations of houses of worship. Uh, government can't dictate theology, can't dictate ecclesiology, can't tell churches how to do its administration or its governance. It can't most of the time interfere with employment practices of churches, uh, particularly the, the relationship between the church and, uh, and ordained ministers. Uh, it, it usually can't deal with property issues, although there are some exceptions. Uh, but, but generally speaking, when there's a church schism, uh, who, gets to, who gets to keep the property and who gets, has to go down the street and, and form the, you know, the second New Harmony Baptist Church? Uh, the, the, gover the, the government through the courts generally will not venture into, into those, those uh, waters under the, the church autonomy doctrine. So those are the three principles in the First Amendment that protect religious liberty. No establishment, free exercise, and church autonomy. Well, how are we doing with respect to each of these three? Let me take them in reverse order. Church autonomy doctrine, we're doing very, very well. Very well uh, on, on this on this uh, score. You may remember the Hosanna Tabor case that the, uh, dealing with the so-called ministerial exception that, that that relationship between the church and the minister and the ministers are, is inviolate and can't be upset by any discrimination laws. Uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 court. Uh, applying this church autonomy doctrine in the Hosanna Tabor t uh, case ruled nine to nothing, nine zero in favor of the autonomy of the church to make decisions without allowing the, the disappointed minister to, to come into court and sue claiming a, 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 a breach of uh, anti-discrimination laws. Um, I tell you, in our, in our cases, First Amendment cases, the court almost never goes unanimous. It's always nearly five to four, six to three, one way or the other. But, but here you, you've got all nine justices with, with, with all the other disagreements that are, that are there and apparent on the court coming together and ruling uh, in favor of the uh, autonomy of, of the church. Actually, in this case, it was not church pastor. It was religious school and ordained teacher who had religious and secular responsibilities. Even in that more difficult situation, the court ruled nine to nothing that the, the church autonomy doctrine uh, prevailed. So I'm very optimistic about church autonomy. Um, churches that do not want to solemnize same-sex marriages are not going to have to under this doctrine. It's just not going to happen. You hear otherwise, but it, uh, out there in, in, in the media, but it absolutely is not going to happen. It's also why under the Affordable Care Act that churches and pervasively sectarian religious bodies are completely exempted from the Affordable Care Act. You know, we're talking Hobby, the Hobby Lobby case dealing with for-profit corporations, and uh, there's, there's some disagreement about how uh, we treat religiously affiliated nonprofits, but nobody really talks much about the fact that churches are completely exempt from the get-go from the terms of the Affordable Care Act, kind of applying this, the idea behind this church autonomy principle. Very important. Secondly, free exercise. We've been up and down over the past 50, 60, 75 years. The traditional formulation was the one that I described a minute ago that you know, the government has to accommodate religious practice unless it has a compelling state interest, a, a very important reason not to, and then only in a, in a less restrictive uh, manner. Um, that high level of protection for free exercise was upset back in 1990. The Native American peyote case uh, blew that up and pretty much gutted the free exercise clause, not just for Native Americans and, and the use of peyote, but for all people of faith. Um, that was followed by legislative action, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, 
1993 that the Baptist Joint Committee was instrumental in leading a coalition to advance. Uh, that that uh, law was then declared uh, several years later partially unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, uh, at least insofar as it purported to apply to the states. Um, that was answered by Congress again with a, a more tailored uh, Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act in 2000 to protect uh, those incarcerated in prisons and, and to f further uh, protect the, the uh, zoning and land use rights of, of churches and, uh, and religious uh, bodies. Uh, many states then passed their own Religious Freedom Restoration Acts Okay, if, if federal RIFRA doesn't apply to us, uh, 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 then we're going to have our own, and that's fine. The Supreme Court see, said that, that you, can, you can do that. And, of course, um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about RIFRAs these days, not just back in the early 90s when a lot of these were passed, but ones that ca came in, in Indiana and Arkansas and, and, and uh, Kansas and, and Mississippi and other places over the past couple of years uh, w with the obvious political energy behind them to uh, tr try to, to uh, uh, set up a firewall against the advance of LGBT rights and same-sex uh, uh, marriage. Um, so uh, over, the, over these years, free exercise has been up and down, up and down, uh, and, and there's been almost a, a food fight across First, uh, First Avenue in Washington, D.C. between the Congress and the Supreme Court back, back and forth. So uh, we, we are uh, moving down the line on free exercise, but I think the last three Supreme Court decisions uh, on free exercise-esque cases suggest that we're doing very well. Uh, I say esque because one of them was a RIFRA case, one was a RLUPA, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons case, and one was a case under the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII, that prohibits discrimination in the workplace based on religion. So, yes, the Hobby Lobby case, uh, five uh, to four, uh, dealing with the Affordable Care Act and the, and the uh, contraception uh, issue, uh, dealt with whether a for-profit corporation could exercise religion and obtain relief under federal RIFRA. Uh, uh, and, and whether this, the, the government had a sufficiently compelling interest to override it. Uh, the su Supreme Court held five to four that it did apply. R RIFRA's provisions did apply to protect uh, for-profit corporations. Uh, a, a major push forward, I, I might say, back when, when RIFRA was being lobbied and, and, and uh, debated in Congress, nobody was thinking about for-profit corporations, particularly far-flung ones with 18, 15,000 employees like, like Hobby Lobby. Of course, individuals, uh, not, uh, religiously affiliated nonprofits, churches, religious bodies, yes, but no one was really thinking about for-profit corporations based on the religious compunction of their shareholders to impute that to the corporation and then let the corporation uh, get protection from objectionable, religiously objectionable uh, mandates of the state to the prejudice and disadvantage of employees. So for better or worse, um, Hobby Lobby was a major advance uh, or, or step backwards, depending upon how you look at it, but a very significant case in, in the area of, of free exercise. Uh, the, another, the other case under the uh, Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, uh, Holt versus Hobbs, dealing with the rights of prisoners. A, uh, a uh, Muslim prisoner in the state of Arkansas wanted to grow, an, for religious reasons, a half-inch beard. And the correction officials in Arkansas said, no, you can't do it. We have a compelling interest. We have an uh, interest in, in safety and, and order, and uh, uh, we're not going to let you do it. They're not going to make that, 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 that accommodation. Uh, and the case went to court and eventually to, to the Supreme Court. The Baptist Joint Committee filed a brief uh, supporting uh, Mr. Mr. Holt in his uh, bid for that uh, modest religious accommodation, we thought, and the court did too. The court thought, no, you don't have a compelling interest, state of Arkansas. What, what are you, uh, you know, uh, are they going to hide uh, uh, tools up in there in a half-inch beard? I mean, hey, you can have long hair. 
You can hide it there. I mean, the beard is not that big a deal. Uh, and it was almost laughable in court that day with the, the justices uh, spinning out hypotheticals about, oh, you, can, you can't get a revolver up there, but you can get a little something. And, you know, on and on and on. In, in any case, the court held nine to nothing. Once again, nine to nothing in favor of accommodating the free exercise uh, rights of this, of this uh, uh, prisoner. Uh, the third case, the Abercrombie and Finch case, just came out this, this past year, uh, dealing with employment rights. A, a Muslim uh, wo a woman sought a, uh, to, to get a job at Abercrombie and Finch, and at the interview wore her hijab, her, her headscarf, uh, was given high marks in the interview, but later on, uh, higher up at Abercrombie said, no, but you know, it, it violates our look policy for this person to uh, wear a hijab on the floor selling uh, the, these Tony uh, articles of, of clothing. Uh, we're going to deny her a job, and she brought a claim under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, and went up through the courts and eventually got to the Supreme Court. We also filed a brief in her favor, uh, and the court ruled this time eight to one, not quite nine to nothing, but eight to one that, uh, uh, that Abercrombie couldn't do what it did. It had to reasonably accommodate her, her religious needs. It couldn't discriminate against her on the basis of her religion and had to uh, uh, give, her the, give her the job that she was otherwise qualified for. So uh, those, those three, three cases uh, in, in the past two years uh, coming from the, the, the Supreme Court uh, uh, t uh, indicate to me that, that with respect to free exercise, we are doing pretty, pretty well. How about the third, no establishment? I think we're doing terrible and we're losing ground. A lot of people complain about free exercise, but I think a more problematic issue has to do with, with the, uh, the, the establishment clause. T two kinds of ways that the, that the government can violate the Establishment Clause. First of all, with what it says uh, in its expression, government actors in, in words or substance or symbols to promote advanced religion, le le uh, leading in government-sponsored religious exercises, uh, Ten Commandment mon uh, monuments, uh, uh, creches and, uh, and other religious uh, symbols, uh, arguably uh, ad ad uh, advanced religion to the extent of violating the No Establishment Clause. On the other hand, there uh, is the whole area of not what the government do, no, does with its mouth, what it says, but what it does with its checkbook, what it pays for, and to the extent it, you know, it pays for religious ministries or the teaching of religion or, or uh, vouchers uh, for those activities, uh, the argument can be made that that is an impermissible advancement of religion uh, to, uh, sufficient to violate the, the no establishment clause. I think we're doing, they're doing certainly, certainly, uh, 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 losing ground quickly on the, the funding side. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, the Supreme Court uh, upheld vouchers for religious education, something that uh, it, had, it had never done be before, uh, a close five to four case, but, but nevertheless um, uh, uh, upheld certain ways of voucherizing religious education with government uh, funds, uh, and, and also more direct forms of uh, 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 subsidies for, for religious activities. Uh, the courts have, have loosened the reins considerably. Uh, the most recent Establishment Clause case dealt with the endorsement side of the First Amendment. Uh, the city of Greece uh, ver, um, involved uh, legislative prayer, religious, uh, religious uh, uh, exercises before a local city council meeting. Uh, that um, that we that we felt violated the no establishment clause for for, for, for government to actually officiate and and promote a religious exercise at the, at the at the beginning of a legislative session uh, was an impermissible establishment. Now I know you're going to say, oh, well they do it in Congress and they do it in uh, in our state legislature, and they, they do, and the courts have upheld prayer in those situations. But uh, particularly in, in Congress, if you go, you know, 
people for the public public might be there but they're way up in the galleries up in the balcony and they're there just to to observe and watch and see what's going on and the chaplain's prayer is for the body and the, the legislators uh, and their work uh, that was that's completely different from what you find found in the city of greece and i would argue in most local uh, uh, council, city council, town council, council meetings where uh, the public is there not just to watch up in the galleries, but to participate, to testify before, before the council, to, to, uh, to, to object to the Walmart coming in down the street, which I guess you did or had or somebody might have here, uh, uh, or, or to get a zoning variance or, or a business license. And, and we just took the position that in that context, in that set of circumstances, it was impermissibly uh, coercive to require those folks to undergo or to experience or participate in a state-sponsored religious exercise as a ticket to exercise, to exercise and perform their civic responsibilities. Uh, we lost the case five to four. The court ruled the other way and said, no, it's, it's not that different from Congress. And we've been doing it for uh, 230 years. And you know, as long as some religions aren't excluded, uh, we're going to say it's OK to have legislative prayer even in that more coercive local environment. We also took the position that, hey, this is not rocket science. There's an easy way to fix this. Can you think of a win-win situation? Moments of silence. Why not have a moment of silence? And people can pray if they wish or not if they don't want to. Uh, nobody's conscience is violated. And, and uh, you know, if you want to have a formal prayer someplace, you know, meet 10 minutes before the session starts down the hall and have your prayer come in, moment of silence, and you're off and running, having solemnized the, the occasion. So uh, for, for all those reasons, it seems to me that and while we're doing great on um, church autonomy and doing pretty good on free exercise, we're really doing terrible when it comes to uh, the enforcing the Establishment Clause uh, in, in the First Amendment. So those are the three principles there. Uh, let me talk just for a couple of three minutes about the fourth principle uh, over in the Constitution itself in Article 6, which says no religious test for public office. Now, not many people uh, had heard about Article 6, I think, when, I, when, I've, when I've talked about it. Uh, everybody knows about the First Amendment, but they're not aware of Article 6 until, until uh, last week when Dr. Carson said that he didn't think a, a Muslim would be qualified or he wouldn't support a Muslim uh, running for and serving as, as President of the United States. And then everybody started talking about Article 6, and it was kind of good in that sense that, that um, now people know it's there and, and how important it is. And it, it, it is a fourth protection in the Constitution along with the three principles in the First Amendment uh, for, our, for our religious uh, liberty. And I, I was heartened to, uh, to, to see that, that he was roundly criticized for, for that uh, uh, remark that he made. And he, of course, tried to, uh, to walk it back and walk it back, but th it was out there. And, uh, and even conservative commentators, uh, columnists, uh, Mike, Michael Gerson, uh, Charles Krauthammer, uh, you know, came out and, and roundly uh, criticized uh, Dr. Carson for, for those, those remarks and his failure to appreciate the importance of the no religious test for, for public uh, office. Um, yeah, you know, most of the colonies had religious tests. So, sometimes they all kind of varied. Sometimes you had to, uh, had to believe in God, you had to have a high view of scripture, you had to believe in the Trinity, and, and they all had, except for Rhode Island and a couple others, had religious tests. And our founders in 1787, 1789 said, hey, we're not gonna have a religious test for public office in the new in the new federal uh, government. So it's in there. The government can't require candidates or prospective candidates to sign on the dotted line of some religious confession in order to qualify to to uh, serve uh, in, in the government. Um, yeah, it is a legal test. It, it says what government can't do. Um, it doesn't say that we can't, as individual citizens, impose a religious test when we. Uh, go to vote or evaluate the candidates. I think it's a bad idea. I think we ought to, to, to live by the spirit 
of no religious test, as well as the, as the letter of, of the law, and allow that to inform our uh, thinking about our voting patterns and, and how we engage the government as, 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 as citizens. Uh, religion, of course, can be taken into account, and, and our public leaders don't have to check their religion at the door. Uh, we can get to know what they believe and, and, and how that affects their fitness for office, uh, particularly if there's a close connection between their religious conviction and some public policy issue that matters. And, uh, you know, so, so religion shouldn't be banned from, from the, uh, the conversation. It should be there, but we should not. Uh, uh, impose religious litmus tests on on our candidates. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I think we are doing pretty well on that this no religious test principle. I think we've made peace with it. You know, Governor Romney's Mormonism came up uh, in 2012. Uh, I, I, I don't think his loss. In, in that election could be blamed on, on his, his Mormonism. And, and of course, that was just a reprise of uh, the 1960 campaign dealing with jo John Kennedy's uh, Catholicism, uh, where we thought we had gotten past that, that, uh, that issue and, and probably, probably pretty, much, pretty much did. Um, I think we have made peace with the no religious test principle 2012 was the first time in the history of the Republic that no white Anglo-Saxon Protestant was on the ticket for either the presidency or the vice presidency of the two main political parties. Had an African-American Protestant, a Mormon, and two Catholics. Unprecedented. How many Protestants are there on the Supreme Court? Yep, zero. Six Catholics and three Jewish justices. Completely different from where we were 50 years ago, 60 years ago, throughout the 20th century, where you had a Jewish seat, perhaps, that was filled in, in, in Syriatum, starting with Brandeis and Cardozo and others. You had sort of a Catholic seat that, that, that would rotate through. But, you know, six or seven members of the Supreme Court were Protestant, mostly Episcopalians. We haven't had a Baptist uh, since Justice Hugo Black. But, but how different today is it where we have no no Protestants on the court, and nobody's complaining. And, 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 they, and I think they probably shouldn't complain. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it, there's a lot of things that matter on the Supreme Court. Gov the justices' philosophy, their understanding of the law, to some extent their, their, their politics, but, but religion under the no religious test clause and principle should not uh, d dictate a, 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 d a different configuration of religion on, on the court. Uh, Congress, gosh, that, how that's changed. We got, you know, t two Muslim uh, members of the House of Representatives. Uh, a a, a uh, Maisie Hirano is a, a, a Buddhist in the Senate. Tulsi Gabbard is a Hindu in the uh, House of Representatives. Christian Cinema is a nun, not an N-U-N, but a self-confessed N-O-N-E. None of the above. Uh, a seeker, searcher, uh, uh, unaffiliated person. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, it didn't used to be that members of Congress would ever admit to that, and there's only one. It's only been in, in recent memory one, one atheist, self-confessed atheist, uh, Pete Stark, who who's out of office now from California. But uh, Christian uh, Christian Cinema is is uh, a, a, a N O N E nun. Um, past 50 years, Protestants have gone from 75 percent in the Congress to today, just over 50 percent. Um, I'm, not, I'm not making a value judgment there, uh, neither good nor bad. Uh, the, the most religious person or the most Christian person is not necessarily the best person to lead this country. Maybe, but maybe not be. I'm just uh, t telling you this to indicate uh, my belief that we're making peace with the no religious test principle in so many different ways. Um, and, and, and beyond that, uh, we appear to come to terms with members of Congress who are neither Christian nor Jewish, taking their oaths of office on their own holy books, okay? Um, Representative Ellison, uh, when he was elected in 2006, um, uh, opted to take his oath of office on the Quran. 
And a great outcry arose. No, you ought to have the Bible like everybody else, even though he's Muslim, but uh, he, he wanted to have it uh, and, and was permitted to, to use the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Quran. Um, Representative Gabbard aff affirmed her oath on the Bhagavad Gita, the, the uh, uh, hin uh, Hindu uh, holy book. Uh, Senator Hirano uh, opted against placing her hand on any book. Uh, Representative Sinema chose uh, to place her hand on the United States Con uh, Constitution. Um, and hardly a peep of protest was heard uh, w when those kinds of decisions were, were made. So that, uh, that tells me that, that, that we are making a lot of progress on the no religious test uh, aspect. Well, I recognize that we have a long way to go. Uh, you know, many still think that we are and should be a Christian nation legally and constitutionally, not just demographically and sociologically. Um, a recent Huffington Post uh, YouGov poll revealed 34% favor uh, Christi uh, establishing Christianity as the official religion of their, of their state. Uh, Islamophobia and, and anti-Mormon prejudice prevail in many quarters. But the fact that an overwhelming Christian majority is willing to elect representatives who reflect America's plush religious pluralism and astonishing diversity, uh, and to give them permission to, to solemnize their investiture without protest, uh, suggests to me that we are making, making some, some progress. Let me conclude with uh, a few words Huh? We could keep going? Well, I'm about out. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, l let, me, let me give you, give you this. It, it's a, uh, a concurring opinion that Associate Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote in the second Kentucky Ten Commandments case uh, in 2005, just uh, a few uh, weeks before she retired. And it, uh, to me, it, re it really sums up and captures what I've been trying to, to say over the past 30 minutes uh, and, and my thinking on how we are doing with our um, work on religious liberty and church-state relations. Uh, and she said this, in the First Amendment, uh, we express our nation's fundamental commitment to religious liberty by the means of two provisions, as we've said, one protecting the free exercise of religion, the other barring establishment of religion. And they were written by the descendants of people who had come to this land precisely so that they could practice their religion freely. Reasonable minds can disagree, she says, about how to apply the religion clauses in a given case. But the goal of the clauses is clear, to carry out the founder's plan of preserving religious liberty to the fullest extent possible in a pluralistic society. By enforcing the clauses, we have kept religion a matter for the individual conscience, not for the prosecutor, not for the bureaucrat. At a time when we see around the world the violent consequences of the assumption of religious authority by government, Americans may count themselves fortunate. Our regard for constitutional boundaries has protected us from similar travails while allowing private religious exercise, and I might add, even in the public square, to flourish. Those who would renegotiate the boundaries between church and state must therefore answer a difficult question. Why would we trade a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly? Why would we trade a system that has served us so well? Not perfectly, to be sure. We often miss the mark. Um, but it's done a pretty good job over the last 230 almost years. For one that has served others so poorly, and it has. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to speak um, uh, today about international religious liberty issues, although that's on the, uh, on the, uh, on the table. And uh, my, my good friend and colleague Susie Painter is going to talk some about CBF's 
Cooperative Baptist Fellowship's initiative at the, on the international front uh, after the break. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, just look around the world. Yeah, you want to talk about persecution? There you go. And to suggest we got persecution in this country, vis-a-vis -vis that, is just to besmirch the, <laughs> the, the persecution and devalue and diminish real persecution that, that is regnant all over the globe. And, and so, uh, yeah, we've, we, we haven't always been just right. We've, we've had some persecution in our, in our, our history in, in this country, but in the main and, and when cons compared to uh, the historical record and what we see around the world, uh, I think we've done a pretty good job of protecting religious freedom uh, for everyone, and um, I thank thank God for that. And I thank thank our founders, our wise framers, for those incredible 16 words in the First Amendment: "Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof." So, yeah. thank you. Well, we'll now take a 20-minute break uh, to do two different things. One is allows our technicians to reset the tapes as they're recording this and to make sure everything gets done right. And also, as the older that I get, the more breaks I need. And so uh, we will assemble back here.